Can I go back a bit to your, to, I suppose, 1981, which was the year suddenly that the world suddenly heard of Jeremy Irons when you had French Lieutenant's Woman and uh, Brides Head Revisited out about the same time. Yeah. But it didn't begin there either. Let's, can we go back to Bristol or wherever it did begin for you? Do you mind? I don't know where it began, really. I mean, I drifted into acting. Um, it wasn't your original idea? No, though. I wanted to be a veterinary surgeon, mm -hmm. um, really. Was that something in the family there, Jeremy? No, it was, it, was, it was purely that I was brought up in the country, and mm -hmm. in a very small way, we had a couple of horses and, and some dogs, and, and, and I thought, how can I make this life go on forever? And was this on the Isle of Wight? We on were the Isle of Wight. Somewhere? Yes, right. Yeah. yeah. And we had uh, a, a great family friend who was a vet, and he had a, a, a practice in London in the weekdays, and he'd mm -hmm. come down to the Isle of Wight at the weekends and do his country practice, do his, his horses and cows, so to speak. And I thought, that's not a bad way to live. I quite enjoy that. So I thought, that's what I've become. And I bought all the books, and I... And then I flunked at 15. Everybody could see that science was not my subject. I mean, but really in a big knot, you know. Um, and so I gave that up and went over to, to English and art and sort of muddled on through the rest of my education and, and, and finished school at 17 and a half or whatever without any idea what I wanted to be. I mean, it's strange. I kept my final report and... Uh, I saw that my housemaster, I went to a boarding school, my housemaster suggested that I go into the paratroopers. He thought that's what I'd be good at, jumping out of aeroplanes. <laughs> um, so none of us knew what, what, what I was going to be suited for at all. And I had at school started reading theatrical autobiographies and collecting them in a sort of gentle way without any sort of knowledge of what I was doing. And then what, but what I was doing was falling in love with the life of an actor, that sort of roving gypsy life, which, which still exists. It's very different than it was in the 17th, 18th century, but it still exists. So you're reading the biographies of the past masters of the stage? Yeah, um, Edmund Keane, mm. uh, mm. David Garrick, mm. Burbage, Irving, Helen Terry, mm. uh, that mob, you know. Mm. Um, and uh, I thought I like, because I've been, I've been brought up in a very structured education, uh, an education which was turning out sort of middle-ranking army officers and bank managers. And, and I thought, uh, I want to be able to sidestep all that. I don't want all that. I don't want to go to work at 9 o'clock in the morning in a suit. Mm. Uh, so, which of course many young people feel. But So I thought, well, if I became an actor, I can sort of sit outside that, comment on it, join it when I want and leave it when I want. And uh, so I gently started getting small little jobs in a theatre and then I went to theatre school and, um, but even then there was no real you couldn't see much talent there I couldn't anyway um, did you enjoy the process of getting on this getting out onto the stage the first time you did that or did you did that do something inside you did you have any really. fear of that or did you what was it like no I was a bit embarrassed yes um, now I hadn't learned about concentration now I find when I'm on a stage in front of an audience, I'm more alone than at any other occasion. I'm completely alone and completely open. But I think that's concentration. I mean, the audience is, isn't there, and I'm able to be much more open than I can be with you. Um, so I, I've always, all my choices in life, I've tried to allow them to be instinctive. Um, and that often means I, I, I make them very late, those choices, but I just allow them to be... In, and, and I think it was an instinctive choice to be an actor. Um, my intellect, I think, told me, don't be an unsuccessful actor, because mm. that ain't no fun. And I gave myself till I was 30, because I thought, well, if I'm still unsuccessful at the age of 30, I can change and do something else. Um, the die was cast by that time. Though, I was yeah. filming Brian Seven French and Thames that year. Yes. So I thought things are moving on. Things are definitely <laughs> moving on. <laughs> what was the experience of Bristol Old Vic like? Was that, did that, I think that was where, it, where you... Um, the, well, I went to both theatre school there for two years and then went down to join the company for a further three right. years. Right, so it was a Bristol training school, or it was an Old Vic training school? It's called the Old Vic Theatre School, right, yes. Right, right. And what plays did you do there? At, at the school? Or no, at Bristol. Once you were in, say, in the, in the theatre itself, do you remember? The very first play I did was Hay Fever, the Noel Coward. Mm. I played Simon and that, opposite the girl who was uh, then to become my first wife. Mm. Um, but then I did What the Butler Saw, Joe Orton. Mm. Uh, playing that ridiculous young man. 
I played a forester in As You Like It. Um, I played Hamlet and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. So I did some Julian Slade musicals. Do you remember Julian Slade? Yes, I do. Salad yeah. Days, Salad that was Days, his most yeah. famous. Yeah. But he, he was a Bristol playwright in a way. And uh, he wrote a lot of musicals just for Bristol. And I, I remember I played one character called Called, uh, there were two servants. One was called Abel and the other was called Disable. And I played Disable, who really couldn't do anything, he couldn't hear, could hardly see. And, and, and since I made the props also, that was my job in the daytime, see. I would concentrate on making just my props. And I would make quite a lot of props too. Huh? And I, I, had, I made this wonderful ear, ear thing, which sort of plugged in my ear, had a long rubber tube, which had a life of its own and finished up on a sort of something which was a bit like a car horn, which you would thrust at people when they were speaking to you and giving, that, giving you their order. Um, and I think I made a bit of a meal of that character. And then I remember another, I played a lot of butlers and waiters and things, another guy who just had to serve tea in the School for Scandal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I gave him very, very high heels. I think he was actually wearing lifts off of platforms to make me very tall. And then I gave him an iPad which was very 18th century, and gave him a, a bit of a jewel. And, and I would go around giving people their tea. <laughs> and it was terribly naughty, because, of course, the audience couldn't take their eyes off. It's extraordinary. <laughs> then we did the Scottish play, I remember, and uh, I was to play Seton, which is a very small character. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, good sort of method actor, I thought, now, why isn't this man going out fighting for Macbeth? Why is he wandering around the castle all the time? I mean, I'm young, I'm obviously, you know, a good, good soldier material. There's some reason why. So I thought, well, he's obviously got a wooden leg, isn't he? I mean, <laughs> of course. He can't. First thing that would <laughs> come to mind. Not only a wooden leg, because you see, if you've only got a wooden leg, you can still fire a bow. So maybe he's only got one arm. So I played him with one arm and a wooden leg. And I had to have a prop, of course, because I had to, had to have of something course. to do in the daytime, you know, something to make. So I made this drum. Because I thought Macbeth, very serious man, needs people need to know when he's coming, and I'm often with him, so a bit of a drum, you see, so people know that he's approaching. So I made his, him his entrance must have been almost unimportant by the time you finished with this. Well, it was because <laughs> Seton has a few entrances and exits without Macbeth, but the great thing was that people would hear him coming for miles. You'd hear a well, bump, 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 and then on he'd come, and uh, I think my hardest, my hardest job that in that particular show was I had to come on uh, and, and give a line, the Queen, my Lord, is dead. And the girls would be, all the girls in the cast would be in the green room, which was, or actually it was a, it was a, a, a prop dock at the back of the stage, mm. and with the Queen. And all of them would make some sort of noise that you would make when a Queen died. It was a sort of wail and a shriek of tears and this sort of thing. And my cue would be after this noise. So I would be waiting in the wings and the girls would do their whatnot on cue, and I'd have to walk on. And to walk on and say the line after the cacophony that they just made, the Queen, my Lord, is, is dead, and not get a laugh from the audience was one of the hardest things I've ever done. <laughs> the, that play is full of difficult things. At the, the, the end, Macbeth is decapitated, and we, we, ha we would make a circle of all these very butch warriors wearing sort of leopard skins, I mean, lion skins and things, and, and they'd be hacking away. And you'd see the sword come up, and it would come down. There was this most dreadful noise. Now, the way we got the noise was to have someone in the wings with an axe and a very, very firm cabbage. And he would bring the axe down on the cabbage, and it sounded just like a... Scrunch. And it was, it was devastating. I mean, it would, the audience were in you know, fear and trembling when that noise occurred. One night, however, half a cabbage rolled onto the <laughs> stage very slowly from the wings. <laughs> To some, so, um, I can see that part of an actor's life is, is, is a lot of fun as well. It is a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. You used to do some busking, I understand, too. So it just reminded me when you said salad days. And you've also, of course, done the My Fair Lady recording. Did you, That's right. Would you like to do a musical on the stage? Is that a. Well, musicals are a lot of fun. Godspell sort of. Godspell, of which course, I did for 18 years. months, was a load of fun. Um, the great thing about musicals are that, in a long run, you know, you tend to come into your dressing room, maybe after a difficult day, and you've got to do the show, and the, you've been doing it for nine months, and you know, oh, Christ, I've got to go on again. With musicals, you have the overture and beginners, you have the music playing, and you hear this music, and it winds you up. It's, yeah, it puts you in good spirits straight off. 
There are a lot mm -hmm. of fun. I'd like to do uh, another one day. Mm -hmm. We're talking about doing possibly uh, a film of Evita. Yes, that's been, in the, that's been in the, in the cards for some time. That's right. Uh, who, uh, who currently has the role of Evita in that? Madonna, it is Madonna. currently. And I, I think it looks as if it'll go ahead. Mm. I mean, you know, nothing is certain until no. it's made. No. Um, and they seem to think they'd like me to play Perron, which would mean that I'd do a little bit of singing, not a lot. Mm. But uh, I don't sing very well. The busking was purely just to make ends meet. I was, it was before I went to, before I got my first job in the theatre, and I worked as a social worker for a while in mm. South London mm. to get some of the bullshit kicked out of me that I'd had put into me during my education, really. You know, work with some disadvantaged people and see what life was really about. Did you do that of your own accord, or did you...? No, I was... Uh, the, the, the school had uh, a sort of mission in South London, and uh, often when uh, boys were leaving and weren't going straight on to university, they would put them there for a while. And so uh, it was a great experience, mm. but apart from free lodging, uh, I was paid about mm. two pounds a week. Mm. I would cycle up to the West End with my, I made this rack on the back of my bicycle for my guitar, and do a queue, uh, one or two a night, and I could make five pounds in, a, in one queue, sort mm. of in an hour, which was like manna from heaven. Mm. I mean, it was big bucks in those days. Mm -hmm. With regard to um, what you want to do in the future, looking back at your career, you never seem to have, I may be wrong, but in the cinema anyway, have you worked with the same director twice? I don't think you have. have no, you? I used to be very worried about that. I thought, they never, they never asked to work with me again. <laughs> Why is this? Why is, and fortunately, uh, David Cronenberg asked me to do his next film, so I thought, oh, well, that's all right, obviously. I'm not too intolerable to work with. Um, Mike Nichols has just asked to work with me again, right. which is nice, because he directed me in The Real Thing with right. Glenn on Broadway. On stage. And I wanted to work with Mike for a long time on film. No, I think the reason probably that you haven't, I was thinking, would be because it seems to be a very personal thing when you when you do accept to do something. I mean, it's obviously got to be something that's interested interests you to do as film because you are you can get quite easily go back to stage and you have done that in the past. You went back to Stratford, didn't you, for that's a season right. not all that long ago? That's and right. And you feel that feel that a necessity for an actor, uh, Jeremy, in your position? No, I don't think it's a necessity to go back to theatre. Um, I think I think you're missing. Uh, a bit if you don't. I mean, there are great roles to be played there, especially if you're English. And we ha still, despite what the Thatcher government did to, uh, to the arts in England, we still have a bit of a, a, a theatrical tradition. Mm, surely do. Um, we still have Stratford, we still have the National. Mm. And I was doing the real thing on Broadway and getting enormous accolades. I mean, like only the Americans can do. Mm. You know, this is the next Olivier, this is the best thing since sliced bread. And I, I said to them at the time, uh, there are more like me at home, you know. Mm. Um, but I knew that a little part of me was beginning to believe what they were saying, and I thought, I must get back to Stratford, where the great actors have played the great roles, and I must play some great roles and see how I stand up, just mm. to get my own sense of perspective back. So what did you do at Stratford in that last season? Do you... I wanted to, I've always wanted to do Richard II. Mm. It's the, it's, it's, I, I think it's my part. I, understand, I know about it. Um, you know, sometimes it's great just have the poetry in the language. In wonderful the way. poetry. Mm. So uh, I said, I want to do that. And they said, fine, good. I said, I want to do a comedy. And Terry Hans, who, who was running the Royal Shakespeare Company at the time, said, look, don't open with Richard II because the critics will slaughter you, whatever. I mean, they will, they'll be waiting for you. You've been off doing movies, earning big bucks, and now you yes. come back to play <clears> the big <throat> leads in Shakespeare, and they will be gunning for you. So if you really care about Richard, don't open with him open with something else, also wind yourself up with that. I said, well, what? And he said, well, we need to do A Winter's Tale. Uh, you'd be good Leontes. Mm -hmm. Now, Leontes is a killer of heart. Uh, I think Shakespeare wrote Othello for Burbage and, and, and watched Burbage do it well, and then said, right, now I'm going to give you an even harder one. Mm -hmm. It's not just going to be jealousy now. It's going to be jealousy like that for no reason. Mm -hmm. So you can't take the audience with you. The audience won't understand why you're jealous. You just have to be jealous and paranoid. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, anyway, I had a, a, a try at Leontes. Uh, there were moments when it was quite good, some nights it was quite good, but overall, I don't think I've, I found him. I don't think it's my character. Mm -hmm. um, the critics were moderately kind. Some of them went for me, as we'd expected. Then I did a, 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 a while that was running, we rehearsed and put on another play called The Rover by a, uh, an English lady who wrote it in 1690, very long time ago. 
during the reign of Charles II, a comedy. It's occasionally revived, isn't it? But only in, I've, I've, yeah, we, I think there hadn't been a production in England since uh, oh, the, the 1800s. Mm. Um, that's, it, that's very occasionally. That's right. <laughs> it's a wonderful play written by a woman about uh, the relationship between women and men. So she writes three great parts for women. Mm and then four wonderful men who, are, who cover the spectrum of the male. I mean, from the rough trade, which is the one I played, uh, to the white knight, to the idiot. Um, great characters and a, a wonderful, raunchy, sexy, funny, anarchic play. A lot of fun with that. Mm. And then I rehearsed and put on Richard. Uh, unfortunately, the critics were by then very kind. <laughs> It's <laughs> not.